this in my remote viewers experience that when you remote view an alien more often than not they are going to notice you and then you could have a visit after that at the time of the incident roswell army airfield was home to the world's only atomic bomber squadron and i'll tell you right now that there are contractors out there now working with the military and government using telepathy and remote viewing to understand what these beings are doing. There was more of a war between, I guess you could say, military officials and extraterrestrial beings. There's the still past. a war, but I think the war was a lot hotter. Right. Back maybe 60s, 70s, 80s-ish. Well, back up a minute. So you went to hang out around a nuclear power plant, like a decommissioned, so obviously. Yeah, decommissioned one. When we've looked at some cattle mutilations, what we've seen is that we've got two different things happening. We either have extraterrestrial activity or human activity looked, looking to be like it's extraterrestrial. Ever heard the stories of UFOs seen around nuclear plants? How about unbelievable sightings of Mothman? Are you interested in unbelievable history? Of course you are if you've been following metaphysical or if you've been following recent whistleblowers like David Grush or even if you went to see Oppenheimer. But today, we're going to go so much deeper into stories of a being actually morphing into a UFO, remote viewing data on what these craft are doing when they're spotted over nuclear plants and so much more. If nuclear technology can split apart an atom and set off an uncontrollable chain reaction, it's really not so far-fetched to think about these stories of bizarre creatures or alien contact. Am I right? So join remote viewer John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. Are you listening to the Metaphysical Podcast on Spotify, Apple, or elsewhere? Go ahead and leave us a five-star rating. A review really helps us. Remember to like, follow, subscribe on YouTube, Rumble, Gangjing World. I've never been there. I need to go check that out. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, and anywhere else so you don't miss out on this amazing content. Okay, yeah, I'm excited about today's um, episode. You know, if if nuclear power plants weren't strange enough, the fact that a bunch of unidentified flying object activity um, just makes it even weirder. Are these military? Are they spy craft? Or are these extraterrestrial creatures that are concerned with how humans are potentially going to blow up a planet that they're that they're frequenting? What do you think? Man, that's a can of worms right there. <laughs> I mean, what do I think it's based off remote viewing data and my own experiences at well, defunct nuclear power plants? <laughs> Just because I went uh, and hung out around one for a bit of time in California. And so you get like a lot of strange activity happening around these places. Well, back up a minute. So you went to hang out around a nuclear power plant, like a decommissioned. So obviously yeah, decommissioned there, one. there was no meltdown. There was no radioactivity. John doesn't have psychic abilities from being bitten by a radioactive spider. This is like a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um, strange experiences. Whether there was ever a meltdown at one of these locations or not, there's still going to be various levels of radioactivity in the surrounding environment. It's just going to happen because there's a lot that's unknown about the particles that are put out by this. Yeah. Uh, so much so that communities around it will have instances of cancer and whatnot, um, regardless. So, you know, also think about uh, cattle mutilations. When we've looked at some cattle mutilations, what we've seen is that we've got two different things happening. We either have extraterrestrial activity or human activity looked, looking to be like it's extraterrestrial. And the intention in both cases is to understand what sort of, of toxins are in specific organs of those animals. And so they remove the parts of the animals, the eyes, whatever, the sex organs, stuff like that, to try to understand you know, what sort of radiation these beings are carrying around with them. So 
so there's huge interest not only by humans but by aliens as well or like aliens is a very broad term though from your data your do you think that these cattle mutilations are more likely to be extraterrestrial in origin than they are occult activity or is there a, is there a both happening there could be occult activity but i don't think occult activity could remove parts of the animal with laser precision and no blood and no footprints <laughs> yeah um, okay so so the animal mutilations um when you get to the high high strangeness ones where there are it's just totally anomalous you'll often find radiation readings you'll you'll see that there's no footprints around you'll you'll see that it's like they've been organs have been laser cut out no blood etc cetera, etc cetera. started off originally most likely with alien type craft doing this and then humans got into the mix too in order to check basically but mimicking what the aliens do in order to keep the whole thing a mystery oh so there are some like there are some human activity revolved around this to throw potential investigators off of the scent of what's going on to make well, it yeah, seem okay, like so more about, like human yeah think about my lab uh, military abduction stuff okay so mm -hmm. So what we, we've got like these aliens who made a deal with uh, a previous administration, the United States, in order to receive technology, they would give the aliens access to the human, like American population. I mean, they would say, yes, you can do it. They could do whatever they want, but they wanted the door open. It's like letting the black eyed children into your home. I just need a glass of water. No, you shouldn't have let that black eyed child into your house. And so... <laughs> So, so it's, it's kind of the same scenario, but, but, but what, and so one of the deal, one of the aspects of the deal was you have to tell us everyone that you're taking, like, we want to know every person that you're taking. So then after they do that, the, the aliens do this, they take them, they check their genetics. The military comes in to pretend like they're aliens using probably costumes, MK Ultra techniques, et cetera, et cetera, to find out why the alien is so interested in that particular individual. So that's where the my lab stuff comes from, right? The military abductions that sometimes the facade drops on it and people see, right? Oh, this is military. What is going on here? Same thing with the mutilation stuff. I mean, how are they extracting those organs without any footsteps or anything like there would have to be some labor involved is there some type of levitating mechanism that comes yeah. in and, and takes stuff right it's the whole it's the whole beam me up scotty thing you know I tons see. of ufo reports where there's a craft above and there's sort of a tractor beam pulling mm. something up into it or people have had that experience as well um so you know that would leave no footprints we need that beaming technology you know, we probably after, have it after hoverboards. Beaming technology seems to be like the next thing that you should have, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Flying cars, the Jetsons. Yeah, never yeah. happened. It's disappointing. It is. It's, it's a little disappointing, but, you know, it is what it is. But UF, UFO activity around nuke sites, you know, this, this is so we're kind of starting to ease into that conversation here with some of these weird things that are going on. We're or that easing we into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's been a whole lot of, uh, of alleged UFO activity around nuclear sites. Kind of started, like, if we're talking about the history here of the whole thing, like, you know, Foo Fighters were seen during World War II. Right. Strange orange flying lights along the French German border. Here's an article that we've we've pulled up. The Pentagon is investigating UFOs that possibly turned off warheads. And and this has been reported multiple times by multiple different whistleblowers. This is not new information that that I'm bringing up, but it is fascinating. Right. So we're we're the Foo Fighters. Really, the question is, were the Foo Fighters that were cited by World War II uh, pilots, were those Foo Fighters the Nazis' technology, which is actually highly doubtful, just based on how far their technology got? Or were they more likely to be extraterrestrials that had seen humans develop nuclear technology and they were worried about humans blowing up the entire world? 
the Nazis were working on on nuclear technology. The Americans were working on it because they found out the Nazis were working on it. And then, you know, the USSR was spying on the on the Nazis. I'm sorry, on the um, the USSR were spying on the Americans who were who were developing all of that. And then, uh, of course, the band, the Foo Fighters, named themselves after the, what was those craft that were seen in World War II. They have oddly stiff arms in that photograph. That was actually like what I got stuck on when I saw that photograph. Maybe maybe the Foo Fighter band is aliens. <laughs> yeah, like the guy on the it's really the guy on the left that it's like, why is that dude on the left standing like that? It's because he was waving too much for the photograph, most likely. So just keep your arms at your side when you get to. OK, so this is like like a similar thing. So Mothman shows up in time before and potentially after some kind of disaster. It's the same thing with UFOs because there's no there's no time is not linear. Time's linear to us, but time is not linear when you can move through dimensions, time and space. And they have technology or understanding on how to do that. So this is why you have, before the first nuclear bomb was dropped, Foo Fighters showing up and very interested in the war, right? This is, there was a really, really, really big thing for humans to create this type of energy, really big. I mean, this like resonated across the whole dimensional multiverse because of what humans created here. So tons of interest around that time frame. Yeah. Yeah, and that that really is what this conversation is about too because what did humans actually create? I don't think humans are even aware of what they actually created. The ramifications of nuclear technology in the quantum verse, whatever you want to call it, um, even at a smaller scale, like what at a microscopic scale, what's really going on, humans are, have no idea. H how is a small particle like that creating that amount of energy? We're talking about forces here that are way, way beyond humans' ability to understand. I mean, it right. It, it's like understanding how to unleash the nearly infinite energy <clears throat> that is in that particle or in those particles. If you can control it and have it not be damaging, there are other things that can be done with it, not just using it as a nuclear weapon. Right, right. And but even the even the idea of it to begin with is destructive which is strange. You either can can create energy from fission, which is splitting a particle, or you can create energy from fusion, which is combining two particles. You can imagine two planets blowing up into one another and the amount of energy that that would, that would create, right? I, of course, this is a little bit different than that. I'm trying to talk about it at a macro scale. But the question is, like, like, actually, it's really weird. Like, Lindsay brought up that that saying by Oppenheimer when he realized what he had done. He said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. And what's weird is most people would be like, oh, because of the bombs that that fell in, in Nagasaki or Hiroshima. But when I when I heard him say that, I was like, that could go either way. He could be talking about at a microscopic level, what happened as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, modern uh, scientists, science, mainstream scientists, um, be they believe in a certain understanding that they have about the multiverse and say there's no way that anything that we do here can affect any other uh, dimension because of the way the multiverse works or is. But that's not what we've seen, not what we've seen at all. In fact, our use of these like subatomic particles, atomic particles and subatomic particles to do this stuff, as I say, when it has ramifications, not just in our world, but across the multiverse, it's, it can be devastating, absolutely 100% devastating. This is why we have so many UFOs in part. This is only one of the reasons. This is why there are UFOs, beings from other places interested in our development of this. 
I think interest is like a little bit of a positive thing. It would be more alarmed. So, yeah, it, it affects it affects everything when one of these is unleashed. Mm. Yeah. And, and so for those of you at home kind of wondering what some of these accounts are, we're kind of going to go through a few of these because the Foo Fighters were just were just one one sighting. Right. But in the Korean War, there was a lot of weird stuff that that went on as well. There was blue green light emitting pulsing rays, which made um, uh, an entire battalion sick with radiation poisoning. We're seeing flying saucers. 42 eyewitnesses, eyewitness reports in 37 months, an average of one a month for more than three years, craft so large they could carry 50 tons of weight and powered by electromagnetic propulsion. Now, the Korean War was, you know, they, they call what was going on between the USSR and America a Cold War. It wasn't a Cold War. It wasn't. <laughs> The Korea, North Korea and South Korea, the war that was happening there was a proxy war between the USSR that was backing North Korea and the United States, which was backing South Korea. And these two countries were basically fighting one another and the threat of nuclear war between those two with the USSR who had that technology and the United States who had that technology on the other side was like a very, very scary real thing. The fact that nuclear technology had been developed at that point had already been utilized. You have two different groups fighting with one another, backed by technological powerhouses. It's not that it's not that surprising that UFOs, if they're interested in that or they really want to be watching that, that they would be seen in Korea during that time. And uh, John, have you heard of Project Blue Book? Oh yeah, of course, yeah, right? It's big. Whoa. Yeah, so. 1950, between 1952 and 1969, the USAF, which is the Air Force, ran a systematic study of UFOs and potential threat to national security and supposedly found nothing of note, but terminated all, all study activity. You know, that's, that's a funny statement that uh, they, they put out there, nothing of note. But yeah. outside of that, the scientists that were involved in, in uh, Blue Book were very interested in in the anomalous side of the UFO phenomena after they exited Project Blue Book. <laughs> yeah, when they were skeptical before, and and you know, as far as UFO type sightings go, most stuff probably is explainable, and the it's easy it's easy for the media and the government to focus on the explainable ones and then paint with a broad brush. But these scientists saw, no, you can't paint with a broad brush because the anomalous ones we can't explain. Right. <laughs> right. That's, I'm telling you, they use, sometimes they use these, like this data as a bat, you know, to beat off spec, like healthy speculation that people should be having around these things. This account we're about to go through is really interesting. It's from a guy named Robert Jacobs, who was a former officer um, and doctor. And now he told the AARO, which is the government's all domain anomaly resolution office, that he made a film for the Air Force in 1964 that captured images of UFO shooting a test missile out of the sky. He saw a UFO firing four beams of light at a nuclear missile undergoing testing. It was a saucer shaped craft. It circled the dummy warhead during a test flight in California in 1964. So quote here, I was quote, I was part of a US Air Force cover up. It was shaped like a flying saucer and was firing a beam of light at our warhead. Now he was dispatched to California to photograph with high speed instrumentation a special missile rocket launch, but the next day he was called into the office of a major where three people in gray suits were waiting for him. They played the footage that had been shot, and suddenly, from in the frame, they saw an object following the text, test missile traveling at 8,000 miles per hour. Dude, 8,000 miles per hour. It fired four beams at the warhead, then flew out of the frame. The warhead tumbled out of space. Now, these, these guys in suits, which, you know, 
you can you can easily assume were CIA, right? So these guys wanted to know if they had played a prank while filming. So if he wanted, they wanted to know if this guy, what he had taped, was a prank. And when they determined it was definitely a UFO, they warned him about security breaches, of course, which is what they would do. One of them privately told him, Lieutenant, if you were ever tortured, if you were ever tortured in the future, somebody has you up against the wall and they're firing your privates. Or excuse me, and they're frying your privates with fire, your private parts with fire. You can tell them this. It was laser tracking, but we never had laser tracking in 1964. Right. What we are here today to tell you is that this is a real event that is the most important event in the history of mankind. We are not alone. Yeah, this stuff happens more more than more than we know. Um, and this like this goes back to a previous episode where we were talking about what did Grush mean by our adversaries, right? When you go into that question with remote viewing and, and, and realize that the adversaries are the ones that they originally made the deals with, the earlier administration, and they came out of it on the lesser side, they started to see what they could do to fight them, right? And so, of course, you're beginning a war there, and you're going to have UFOs show up at missile sites. You're going to have them show up at missile tests. You're going to have them show up in, 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 pro in locations that we don't even know about where stuff is going on and probably everywhere else. I mean, okay, here's an interesting thing. Ingo Swan, who was the godfather of remote viewing, had an experience where he was pulled into a secret black project of a, with a guy named, he called him Axelrod, who was leading the project. And he wanted him to remote view um, stuff on the moon. Mm -hmm. Now, Ingo's remote viewing stuff on the moon. Ingo didn't believe in aliens or anything like that. He didn't know anything about that. Wouldn't even think that there's anything on the moon, uh, as we're all led to believe. And he started to come across structures during the session. And then he came across a being there, an alien. And immediately Axelrod, who was monitoring Ingo during the session, said to him, did the alien notice you? Get out now. Get out now. Get out now. And he, he, he really made it clear to Ingo that if you, if you go there, you can't get noticed. Okay, so this is in his book, Penetration. Now, when we look with remote viewing, what does Axelrod understand or what did he experience with regard to aliens noticing a psychic? So obviously Axelrod had done this before with psychics, right? He had to have, otherwise, how could he know not to be noticed? From my experience and my remote viewer's experience that when you remote view an alien, more often than not, they are going to notice you. And then you could have a visit after that because I and others have been visited after remote viewing aliens, right? Is it they like can a track bullying you event? Do they bully you? Like they, or they're just curious about you? They're not curious about you. They, they bully you. Yeah. They'd they want you to, bully you. They want you to yeah. stay away, basically. They want you to stay away. Okay, so what happened to Axelrod? How come he was so adamant about it? What experience or what did he know? So when we looked at that particular thing, Axelrod had, he was part of that war to gain intelligence. And how are you going to gain intelligence on these things except for using psychics and remote viewers, right? As part of the whole construct of it. And I'll tell you right now that there are, contractors out there now working with the military and government using telepathy and remote viewing to understand what these beings are doing. That is part of every single program that deals with these beings. And I know this because of the people that I know, that I've known in the past. What happened to Axelrod was that they were using psychics in the past before Ingo to understand what's going on on the moon and to understand that whole alien construct that they ran up against that they went into a war with. What happened when he did that is that they got noticed and a remote military base where they were working got decimated. Like we're not talking about like deactivating a nuclear site or a missile, but they collapsed buildings. Mm. So mm. there was a period of time where this war was probably a heck of a lot more intense because nowadays when we remote view them as civilians, it's not that 
you know, we don't get destroyed. Our house doesn't get attacked. Instead, we get warning after warning after warning, right? So it's a crazy thing. Okay. It's a lot of information there. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there was more of a war between, I guess you could say, military officials and extraterrestrial beings. There's the still past. a war, but I think the war was a lot hotter. Right. Back maybe 60s, 70s, 80s-ish. I think it was mm -hmm. a lot hotter. And what could have happened is that the, the humans basically got more technology. Maybe there's those from other sides, other worlds that started Balanced to step in and help humans. A little bit. And yeah, exactly. Right. Very, because when very the deals were first made, like when you think about it, the deals were first made with the humans and with, with the gray type aliens, there's nothing the humans could, the humans had to agree to the deal because those aliens were going to do it no matter what, right? And that was a relationship at the beginning that, that they could not deny. They had to do it. Um, and they might as well receive something from it. And so in the beginning, it was okay. It was good. But there were a lot of those in the intelligence world and military world that saw how bad this is getting and what humans are actually to these beings. So that's when the war began and it was probably pretty hot. Mm. That's crazy, man. Yeah. There's other, there's other accounts here too. So, an ex, so ex Air Force personnel, um, UFOs, deactivated nukes. This is from 2010. Okay, so the the gist of it is basically 120 former service members told UFO researcher Robert Hastings they'd seen UFOs near nuclear weapons weapon storage and testing grounds. Um, so now the United States Air Force personnel at a press conference in Washington in 2010, testified to the existence of UFOs and their ability to neutralize American and Russian nuclear missiles. Okay, so account number two, Robert Salas. This is pretty interesting. Uh, so Stars and Stripes quoted former Air Force Captain Robert Sol Salas, who was at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana in 1967 when 10... Uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that he was overseeing suddenly became inoperative. And at the same time, the base security informed him of a mysterious red glowing object in the sky. After telling the airmen above not to let the object get past the perimeter fence, the 10 intercontinental ballistic missiles he had a purview over suddenly became deactivated, Salas said. He feels the aliens were sending a message, literally shining a light on nuclear weapons. So could, they could have had a lot more damage, permanent damage to our weapon systems, but they didn't, Salah said. If they wanted to destroy them with all the powers they seem to have, I think they could have done that job. So I personally don't think this was a hostile intent. Robert Jameson, a retired U.S. Air Force nuclear missile targeting officer told of several occasions of having to go out and restart missiles that had been deactivated after UFOs were suddenly or sighted nearby. A thought that it, it, it was not of ill intent, just to point something out. I don't know if he know if he would know the background of what was going on. Likely not. Um, this is a message more so on fighting because there is a there's a chance that these were used on them. I mean, why wouldn't they, right? Why wouldn't if 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 the US or any other country has nuclear weapons, why wouldn't they use it to try to deal with these things? They would have. They Absolutely. would. The I mean, we haven't seen stuff in the data going that way, but they would have. Or at least it 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 would be a threat to them anyway. It'd be right. like a, an explosion that large. I mean, how do you contain an explosion that large? I mean, you're totally right. And the Pentagon, like at that time, especially, they're not going to not fire their strongest weapon at an enemy that they don't understand. Right, right. You know, I mean, also think about all of the UFOs that they've captured um, that they couldn't get into. I mean, eventually they're going to try a nuclear weapon to see if they can get into it with that. Is it going to blow a right. hole in it? Is it going to obliterate it? Is it going to do nothing to it? So that was crazy. And John, I found this. 
on um, the International Atomic Energy Agency site. This this kind of blew my mind a little bit. Well, for one, that it was there, uh, but two, some of the peripheral research that I did around this, like everyone knows now I'm going to read this from here. It says everyone knows about the reported recovery of a crashed alien spaceship near Roswell, New Mexico in July, 1947. However, most people are unaware that at the time of the incident, Roswell army airfield was home to the world's only atomic bomber squadron, the 509th bomb group. Was this merely a coincidence? Did they sh maybe they shot it down, dude? Like you were just saying. All right, now now check this out. Uh, during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union built thousands of the far more destructive hydrogen bombs. Some of them a thousand times as destructive as the first atomic bombs dropped on Japan. At the nuclear standoff between the superpowers that erupted into World War III. Human civilization and perhaps the very survival of our species would have been at risk. Did this ominous state of affairs come to the attention of outside observers? Was there a connection between the atomic bomber squadron based at Roswell and the reported crash of a UFO nearby? Did those who pilot the UFOs monitor the superpowers nuclear arms race during the dangerous Cold War era? Do they scrutinize American and Russian weapons sites even now? UFOs and nukes provide the startling and sometimes shocking answers to these questions. Veteran researcher Robert Hastings, who's coming up here again, has investigated nuclear weapons related UFO incidents for, for more than three decades and has interviewed more than 120 ex US force personnel from former airmen to retired colonels who witnessed extraordinary UFO encounters at nuclear weapon sites. Their amazing stories are presented here. Now, this is describing a book, as you can see on that website that we just pulled up. I got really curious after I saw that. I just thought it was too weird. And I immediately decided I would start looking up cryptids in New Mexico. And um, of course, but of course, of well, course, I, UFOs, you're going to look up cryptids in New Mexico. Yeah. I mean, wow. it, I think because you and I were talking about Mothman and how Mothman right. somehow, when we're noticing Mothman, we're also seeing UFOs. And, and then we're seeing Mothman at nuclear sites and we're seeing UFOs at nuclear sites. And I was like, well, this is strange, right? So first, of course, I look up, well, you know, are there any new active nuclear uh, plants in New Mexico, of which there aren't any? However, we do know that New Mexico was where the first atomic bombs went off and that bomber squadron and the Roswell alien crash, right? So... I start looking around for cryptids. I start finding some weird things like there's sightings. The Native American lore in New Mexico is strong. There's lots of sightings of different things. You've got the Chupacabra, like some of these other things. There are like centaur sightings in New Mexico. Like people don't even like talking about it because they don't want to be called crazy. But there are there are like locals in some of these areas that talk about it. Now, what really stood out to me more than anything i think was in a place called las lunas which is mm, kind of closer to the colorado border i found something really strange i found that there is ancient artwork of what people are calling mothman this is the, now these are actually ancient ruins that they found now there's this like strange being and now they're also comparing or they're kind of like it's an interesting article because they're talking about some of the more ancient aztec things where they're starting to bring in quasicodal and stuff to this too who's a very strange historical um being of some sort uh but there's people that are convinced that this thing is is mothman you know, and then it just was weird because you when you and I were talking about this previously, you kept talking about how time doesn't really exist linearly for Mothman the way that it does for human beings, like the way that we think of time and that the same thing for UFOs and stuff. And it's just weird that there were potential sightings of Mothman. This was not the only, mind you artwork that had come from back then there was multiple different instances of artwork in this one area um 
of Los Lunas. You know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just thought that was really strange. I, I've never, I've never seen, I've never even heard of that. That's that's crazy. That's something that something we're gonna have to look into. I think so. And that's a really, really, really good lead actually for remote viewing. Okay, located about 12 miles southwest of the modern town of Las Lunas is the ancient village where a ritual um, of this sort, so it's talking about something previously in the article, may have been performed. Archaeologists know it as Pottery Mound, named for the profusion of polychrome pot sherds. In fact, a greater variety of pottery styles were found there than at any other spot in New Mexico with culturally distinctive ceramics from the Zuni and Acoma regions to the Northwest and the Hopi region in Arizona, even farther Northwest. About 90% of the pottery retrieved from this site is non-utilitarian or decorative. So it is in, so in its heyday, the place was probably a major ceremonial center. More information about that place. So the whatever is here, it's a cultural hotspot, a very ancient cultural hotspot. And I think that some of the like some of the drawings of this being, whatever it is, there are different drawings of it. You can see that one of them that looks kind of like Santa Claus, like the Santa Claus Mothman. The wings look very moth-like or butterfly-like, which is, I think, why people are assuming that this thing is Mothman. Okay, now there's this red out, like red, it, the, its body is being looked at as red, but these wings are very, like it is humanoid looking. It's got this strange snout. Proboscis, I guess yeah. that's what it's proboscis is that what it is i guess yeah that's but see that's weird so how could they relate this to the modern mothman um i mean obviously this is some type of moth butterfly subject you remember the mm -hmm. battle of la it's like oh, yeah. during world war ii ufos flying over la they're shooting anti-aircraft on their like spotlights i think now Correct me if I'm wrong. I could be totally messing up here. I do think that around that period of time, people were seeing a large butterfly type thing in the sky creature. It's interesting. I don't know. Like when people talk about the Mothman, they never say it has a proboscis, right? It, it's usually just like a basically a, a hump on shoulders with red eyes. You know, this thing could be it or not it. I don't know. This is, this is like a good lead to look into. It's a good lead. It's weird. Now, the, the wings are obviously interesting about that thing. I think that it's a big jump to say that this thing they found on pottery in Los Lunas or near Los Lunas is, is, is Mothman. Of course, it's a giant right. leap. However, you know, we're, we're talking about a time when references to Quetzalcoatl uh, co am I pronouncing that right? In fact, Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. Thank you for those of you at home. Please excuse my inability to pronounce things. Quetzalcoatl. Words are hard. Yeah, they are. They really are. Especially for us podcasters who get scrutinized for pronouncing every single thing wrong exactly. all the time. Um, so Quetzalcoatl. He, this was a very mysterious being in history. The Aztec culture itself was just so kind of weird like the beings that you see on the sides like it almost appeared as if there was a separate different race in that part of mexico at the time or new mexico even you know what is this thing is it related to the animals and the beings that were there at that time somehow um was it a deity yeah it's it's hard to say but it is it is a strange lead for us to follow up on what this thing was that they were painting. And maybe what we can do is we just have an episode centered around the Aztec culture and maybe even what was really going on and just do a deep dive on the whole thing and then reveal anything we found about this thing because it's strange. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so John... Anything um, outstanding with these this subject that you'd like to to kind of tell us 
uh, anything extra that you've that you've found in in your um, remote viewing on yeah um, when you you the, like the nuclear sites yes. and you know yeah so in general whether it's a commissioned or decommissioned nuclear site there are more sightings than in other areas of UFOs and whatnot right so you pointing that thing out and the, the reason why according to remote viewing data is is multiple. So there's a frequency. There are frequencies, particles that we don't know how to track that, that come off of these sites. That's also why you have uh, aliens. I mean, I've been to this one where there's alien activity all around it. Uh, the ground nuclear shifting site. around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you uh, went to a nuclear site. Yeah, in the areas it. around it, surrounding it. And they're, they're pulling stuff out of the ground. They're monitoring. They're putting instrumentation in certain areas. They are using it. They're, in a sense, I mean, they are cleaning it up as well by what they're doing. They're, they're, de they're neutralizing it to a certain degree. But they're also interested in using it for their own, um, whatever, their own technologies and whatnot. Now you have like interdimensional type things that go on here in these sites whether commissioned or decommissioned, because the particles and energy that we don't know about that this stuff is putting off can create a situation where portals can open up, where portals, energy openings between worlds can occur. This is what we see in the data. I have no idea how it works, but it's kind of like when you look at a location that has natural energies and people claim there's a portal there or you get a lot of like a uh, hyper paraphysical sort of activity more so than in other areas always goes back to a portal energy is creating a portal. So you find this with the nuclear sites and they use that as well to traverse dimensions. I mean, one of the ideas about the Hanford site, for instance, is that, and the amount of cryptids, like for instance, in the, there's something called the um, Ebony ape, ape cat that people talk about in a specific area somewhat near the Hanford nuclear site, some people think that this thing could have been a mutation of some of the animals that they were experimenting on at that nuclear site, and it got out. It's like a black panther. Some people say it has an ape-like face. Some people say it's just this black panther that's roaming around. But apparently, there are a lot of witness sightings. So, so. It could be related to the nuclear site. I don't have enough like sighting data information on this thing yet to task on it, to find out like where it came from. I need, I need more solid stuff to task on because right now they're just, they're, I think there's like one or two stories out there, even though some people claim there's lots of witnesses. I haven't, I haven't gotten anything good to task on yet. So some people think it could come from that experimentation or it could have come from one of the portals either there that was created or in mm. this area in general around um i think it's in uh clickitat county specifically in clickitat county washington there are going to be weird things going on and you can literally if you hung out somewhere near a decommissioned nuclear power plant you're probably going to find stories from the local population on strange things going on as well as see things yourself i've when I was doing, when I was camping out near one, for instance, we not only had UFO activity going on that witnesses were reporting to us that we were investigating, we also had a woman in a house down the street from these other people. And this is a very rural fields, like growing stuff area, um, farming area, had a, she just called it a monster show up and chase her around outside and then inside her house. She started screaming for the neighbors. The neighbors came over and chased the thing away, right? So you get to these sites. This is right near the decommissioned nuclear power plant where there's all sorts of alien activity monitoring and taking this stuff. And you get other types of cryptids showing up. So. It's just weird how much it reminds me of the Montauk project story where the radar, the sage radar, they, they pump it up this as, as powerful as it can be, um, emitting frequency. They, they leave it on for an extended period of time and the energy ends up 
according to Preston Nichols, opening up a portal in time space and connecting another dimension, I guess, to ours and beings start to come through. Is it just this energy that humans don't understand that's potentially doing this, like whether it be nuclear energy or electromagnetic energy that can actually create the the proper recipe for a portal to open up? Right, right. I know. I I know. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, and so just to put it out there, I don't recommend that people go camp out around these decommissioned sites. There's there's toxicity in the area still in the ground and whatnot. So I just don't recommend it. If anything, you know, put up cameras if you can, you know, in a way that's not, not invading people's privacy. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Don't don't put yourselves in danger out there. Um John's a trained professional that doesn't care if he grows another head. So it's a completely different exactly. thing. Just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, so was this thing, um, was this thing that chased the woman through the house, this ape cat thing, or was it another entity? No, entirely? no, it was something, it was bipedal and large, tall. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like bipedal, a large. Wolfman? It, it, was or a... it was some kind of dog thing. Yeah. Probably a dog man. Well, in the in the in the in the the accounts of of dog men, which we have not gone into yet that much in the show, there's something s extra creepy about some of these accounts that people have have kind of shared, where this particular entity will get up close enough to a person's house to actually open up the door, peer inside, and maybe even come in. And I'm not trying to scare you when I say that because the accounts of these are very, very small. There's a very oh yeah, they, yeah, exactly. They'll try doors and stuff, try to open windows. Yeah, this is the sort of like crack addict version of a dog man <laughs> from Harry Potter. This like scary thing that no one would ever be afraid of. So most of the people when they describe dog man that have had an encounter will say it looked like the Van Helsing Wolfman Dogman thing. They will say it looked exactly like that. That's like the Arnold Schwarzenegger jacked on right. steroids version mm -hmm. of, of, of a werewolf, basically. That's, that's it yeah. right there. With the ears pulled back like that and this like yeah. crazy, crazy face. It's like if, if Dogman were the lead singer of a, of a heavy metal band, Anyway, this has been a really very interesting episode. I hope everyone uh, listening right now uh, that you liked this episode. And if you have comments for us, we'd really love to hear. So please comment below. Uh, we're always looking for, you know, stories and things that you guys would like us to look into. So definitely, um, definitely comment below and let us know what you think. Uh, John, did you have anything else to add for this episode? No, I don't. Just, you know, again, reiterate, don't don't go hanging out at defunct nuclear power plants. Stay off the swing sets, kids. Stay off the swing sets. And if you like um, if you love the information that we've that we've got in this episode, uh, definitely think about supporting us by going over to rise.tv where we've got like 400 videos on research on a lot of these topics that you love. Mothman, werewolves, vampires, any of that cryptid type stuff. We just dropped a very recent uh, series on reptilians, and and what's so weird about this series is that we didn't we didn't do any of the conspiratorial stuff. We literally just took all of the instances where strange reptile beings, bipedal reptile beings, were reported on in newspapers throughout history in the United States, and we talk about those specific instances. And it's a very refreshing and actually extremely entertaining version of everything that's going on out there about reptilian sightings and all of that. So definitely check that out. If you haven't on rise.tv, it's only nine 99 a month over there and you just, you get so much more. So instead of like Patreon, we developed this site so that we'd give you guys more. Um, There's and, tons there, tons, yeah. tons, tons, something for yeah. everyone. Yeah. And John has a really cool series there called Chronicles of a Psychic Spy, where he kind of just, <laughs> he solves it incredible mysteries that have that have evaded us for a really long time um and actually yeah this this episode here uh we, we just released for metaphysical on rise.tv uh one of the cool things about you having a subscription to rise.tv 
is that you'll get our metaphysical episodes two weeks before anyone else. As a courtesy for those who are subscribing and uh, supporting us, you get those episodes early. Uh, so if you can't wait to see the next episode, you can go there and get a couple of new episodes right away. Well, John, thanks so much for being with us. And for everyone at home, we thought you, we hope you thought this episode was as out of this world as we did.